Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Today, we are joined by New Maryland Councillor Alex Scholten. New Maryland is situated just a short drive from the city of Fredericton. This charming community offers a perfect blend of rural tranquility and modern conveniences. The heart of the community is its vibrant village center, where historic buildings and tree-lined streets create a welcoming atmosphere. Here, residents and visitors alike can find a variety of locally owned shops, cozy cafes, and family-run businesses. From artisanal boutiques to cozy bookstores, there's something to delight every shopper. Whether you're seeking a peaceful retreat or a vibrant community to call home, New Maryland offers the best of both worlds. With its natural beauty, small town charm, and strong sense of community spirit, it is no wonder that this hidden gem is considered one of New Brunswick's most desirable places to live. This is Cross Border Interviews with Councillor Alex Scholten. Councillor, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start at the beginning and get to know the person behind the persona of a councillor's position. And I want to start by asking you the same question I've asked every single municipal leader who's ever appeared on this show, so you're no exception, Alex. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? Uh, I guess the the uh, one of the main reasons that I got involved with this was uh, my... My father's family immigrated to Canada in 1952, and they had 19 children, and my grandfather had about $145 in his pocket. Uh, they were escaping the uh, ravages of war in, in Europe and, and in Holland in particular, and they would not have survived had it not been from the support of the community. And that, um, growing up and hearing the stories of the, the trials and tribulations that the family went through, um, had a big impact on me and, and my family as well, uh, my brothers and sisters, in terms of recognizing fully what or how important a community is and the need then as well to contribute back to the community to make sure that uh, you're doing everything you can to help the community. So that was one of the main reasons. But the other thing is I, I've been also involved in business for many, many years. And one of the... Uh, the things that I've really um, stood by th throughout my business career is that if I'm going to benefit from my community, I have to make sure I'm supporting my community. So those kinds of things really went into my mind when I got involved in municipal politics too. I want I didn't want to be the kind of person that just complained about things and then didn't do anything uh, to have a positive impact. Um, I'm not the kind of person that sits back and, and uh, uh, just lobs complaints from afar. Um, I, if I want my community to be better, I want to be part of that solution. What was it about the allure of municipal politics? Because giving back and contributing to your community are two different venues. You could have given sure. back in many different ways through nonprofits, through volunteerism, through the business community. But you chose, and correct me if I'm wrong here, because New Brunswick has the tendency of not putting all their election results on the websites. Um, I can find the first election that you stood in and won was in 2016. Was this Is this correct? Yeah. That's so right. what, yep. what was going on in 2016 that you said to yourself, Alex, it's time to put up and shut up. If I want to make my community better, if I want to give back, I need to yep. do it by sitting on village council. Uh, my, my kids uh, had gone to school or yeah, had gone to school in New Maryland. Um, we have a wonderful uh, school. So I'd been involved with the, uh, the school there. And I saw some of the things that um, really um, had a big impact on our community through the school. And um, with that, I could I saw some things that we could be doing uh, differently, how things could be done differently within the municipality that would bring that relationship closer. So, uh, you know, th those were some of the things that really um, caught my eye, but also uh, just seeing some of the things that you hear from uh, residents always anyway, that the concerns about uh, how your tax dollars are being spent um, the kinds of things that were required or what residents thought were required in the community, be it housing developments or, um, you know, safe, uh, feeling safe in your community, um, having good services like uh, garbage removal, um, all those kinds of things. I had talked to other people in the community, um, 
wanted to get involved to be able to have a positive impact on those things as they would impact others in the community. Now, you've been on council for since 2016. You got reelected in 2020. I can imagine giving back to your community. You you never expected a global pandemic to sort of throw a wrench into community life in, in general. Um, can I ask a very weird question to you? And I feel like you're you're up for it. Sure. The global pandemic happens in the middle of your term. You you could have walked away, and most people would have, because there's a lot of challenges that faced municipalities in 2020 when the global pandemic hit. Why offer re-election in that tough year? Was it something that, was there a desire to continue to give back, or you saw what was going on in your community and you wanted a sort of a steady hand at the wheel while you navigated this unprecedented reality that we lived in? Yeah, uh COVID was certainly um, an area that uh, I wanted to continue on because I felt the responsibility to the community. And we had uh, already an experienced council uh, and, and knew going into uh, that election that there would be challenges ahead. Uh, so having that experience to be able to uh, continue on on a stable basis was important. But also over and above work with the municipality, I had joined the, um, the Union of Municipalities in New Brunswick which represents all municipalities in the province. And knowing um, what was coming in terms of municipal reform, um, the challenges that municipalities had, but also the unique perspective that municipalities would bring both going into COVID and how we could come out of COVID. Um, there was a lot of things because we're the closest level of government to our constituents um, that really made us that much more um, impactful in people's lives and uh, having that sense of responsibility uh through covid uh, really um uh, were heavily on my mind too on, on wanting to continue in the next election as well so the reason i asked the the covid question is because it brings up a part of the show that i talk about a lot um the jurisdictional role that municipalities play in the day-to-day -day lives like you just said you are the closest to the people you make a decision it impacts the people the next day you don't go off to the capital you don't go off to ottawa to do your job you are in your community 24 7 in your time a tenure as a municipal politician have you seen the jurisdictional role change prior pit to pandemic to after pandemic. And I see you raise your eyebrows a little bit there. So yeah, I'm assuming I know what the answer is, but I, what has been the biggest eye-opening change that you've seen with the role that municipalities play in the day-to-day -day lives of everyday people in the communities that they serve? Yeah, that's that's been um, very interesting too. And, and I think COVID um, contributed to part of that too, because um, as um, governments uh, kind of, I wouldn't say necessarily shut down a bit, but certainly weren't as open to meeting people. Uh, you look at, at government services not being as readily available to people in person. Um, our residents were looking for answers to questions that they had. And because we were the closest level to, to them, because we were living in their neighborhood and they knew us by name as we'd walk down the street, um, you'd constantly be asked, what about this? What about that? And even though it wasn't within our jurisdiction, um, you still feel a sense of responsibility to help residents in any way you can. Um, that's one part of it too. But we also have, as I mentioned earlier, um, a, a great deal of municipal reform going on in the province right now. Uh, for the last couple of years, we've been involved in the whole process of identifying what is needed to create sustainable and vibrant, vibrant communities. And as a result of that, our provincial government has downloaded a lot of services to municipalities that weren't there before. So that blurring of who's responsible for what, um, I think is exacerbated. Um, but also uh, in many cases, if provincial government or the federal government doesn't wanna do something or there's no money for it, they'll look to the, the municipalities and they say, it's their responsibility. And municipalities would look and say, no, it's their responsibility to the province or the feds. But again, we are the closest level of government to residents, our constituents. They don't want to see the finger pointing. They just want answers to questions or issues solved. So yes, the, um, the, the jurisdictions are blurring, 
Um, but I think a lot of that we bring on ourselves because if our constituents don't understand issues, don't understand what those jurisdictions are, they're going to reach out to the people they're mo most familiar with and comfortable speaking to, which is typically municipal officials. Now, I, I've had the pleasure of sitting down with a, a lot of mayors and councillors from Atlantic Canada, and I can tell you the one thing I hear often when I speak to uh, people in your position out east is it's easier for you to get your MLA, your MP on the phone than traditionally the average citizen. And you say you don't like to finger point. And I agree. Finger pointing is the worst thing that can happen in municipal, uh, in politics in general, because really the person's coming to you for a reason. They might know you a little bit better than their MP. They might have had relations with uh, potentially meeting you at the local bar or in the grocery store. They have a closer knit relationship with you than their uh, elected officials in higher jurisdictions. But <laughs> is that right? Is that right where they are coming to you and putting pressure on you to say, hey, Alex, I, I know education is not your priority. It's not your jurisdiction, but you have a better chance to get the Minister of Education on the phone than potentially I do. What do you do in that situation? Because you know you can only go uh, so far in your role as a counselor, as a council, is, is there a point in time when you just have to say, okay, I can only go as far. Maybe John has to go an extra step and maybe go to the MLA's office or the MP's office to get that meeting. And I can only try to facilitate, or are you willing as someone who seems so passionate about their community to say, okay, give me your phone number. I'll call you back in a week's time with the information that the MP or the MLA has provided. Yeah, I, I think I've, I, I take a bit more responsibility on than I probably should in that if, if a constituent comes to me and asks me about an issue that is not within my role, but they're frustrated because they haven't heard from their MLA or they hadn't heard from their MB, I, I will take their, their case to our MLA uh, if it's, uh, or to our MLA. Um, and, and we have a great relationship with our MLA here in our riding too. He's been fantastic. Um, and, you know, typically if, if I call or there's an issue and we, we as a council reach out to our MLA or our MP, uh, he'll, he'll respond. So it, I think in those cases, it's a matter then I'll take it back to council. We'll talk about it a bit further and then we'll take it to our MLA. Uh, and, and that extra level of attention typically gets more attention back. So it's, again, I, I don't feel it's it's responsible just to simply say, that's not us, sorry about that. It's uh, what can I do to help? How can I, how can I uh, get you the information that you need? Um, and again, it's not fully within our responsibility, but at the same time, if it's an issue of our constituents, it's an issue of mine. So. You, you talked about government reform, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit in part two, in segment two of this interview. But I want to talk about the role of council and you, particularly your role on council. I can imagine after eight years, you've had to make some pretty tough choices around that council table. And you have had to sort of lay your head at night thinking that you've done the best you can do with the information you have been provided. How do you make those tough decisions? Because you are impacting people's day-to-day -day lives. And like I said, you don't go off to the capitals to do your job. You are in your community. And the decisions you make around that council table are going to impact people. Is it hard to make sure you're doing the correct thing for your community while trying not to make the biggest impact in your community the most negative way in some sense? Yeah, and, and look, I, I think... I, I always just hearken back to the reason I think we were elected at this level. It's to do what's best for our community. It's not what I personally feel all, always. It's, you know, based on the facts, based on the knowledge that I have about the situation we're in, what's the best decision for our community? And that's not going to please everyone. Um, you know, the uh, the ideal that you know, you're not going to please everybody all of the time. Uh, just it, it make it's not easy. But there are definitely difficult decisions that have to be made. And I, I rest easy thinking that uh, in my mind, I've done a good job if I've done what's, what I believe is best for the community. And, and I, I could give you some examples around um, housing developments. Uh, in particular, uh, we have issues where um, 
you know, if, if a resident doesn't like what's going on uh, with the new development across the street, um, you know, we have to look at what's needed in our community. We have to look at what's best for our community as a whole. Um, certainly, we take those individual concerns into account, but we have to look at the community as a whole. And, and that uh, that's always, um, it's a challenge, but it's always how I can rest easy making decisions on that basis. How important is it for yourself, and I'm speaking as you as the counselor here for a second, how important mm -hmm. is it for you to talk to the people who may disagree with you? Because you, while you were elected, you were elected to represent everyone, not just the people who voted for you, not just the people who follow you on social media, but everyone in your community. How important is it for you and your council and people around uh, in New Brunswick as elected officials to listen to all sides of issues and not just the people in our own social echo chambers. I, I think that's critically important uh, to hide behind a decision, uh, making um, the decision based on what you think without speaking to everyone involved, I don't think is a responsible way to do this. Um, you, you have to turn off some of the criticism that may come your way, but that's part of the role. You know, we, uh, we take on these roles to make sure we're representing our community. That's the good, the bad, and the ugly. And uh, you know, it, it's something that for me to make an informed decision, I have to hear from all perspectives. And uh, I can't simply hide behind just what I think I want to hear. It's gotta be from, from what all angles are. And I, I don't think I've ever shied away from that. Uh, those discussions, they're not always easy, but uh, it's something that you have to take on. Does it get easier? Because there are people who are potentially putting their name forward in uh, municipal elections in Nova Scotia, in New Brunswick, Saskatchewan, Northwest Territories, in the Yukon, across Canada, who listen to the show. Does yeah. decisions get easier? And does listening to people who disagree with you get easier over time as someone who's been doing it for eight years? I, I don't think it's easier. I think you just develop a thicker skin. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Love the answer. <laughs> Yeah, well, it, it, in this day and age, too, it, it's it's become um, much more uh, challenging with social media and with uh, keyboard warriors out there who will criticize anything and everything without having all the facts. So we, we see that often in our, our community, uh, some of the community website or the Facebook page, pages and, and the posts um, with people making mad speculation on why we made a decision. And we try to avoid those discussions directly online, but it's difficult. Uh, but reaching out to some of them and just say, look, if you want the facts, come in, we'll, we'll have, a, have a talk about it. I'm open any time to do that. Um, and that's not for everyone because not everyone wants to face the, uh, the confrontation that may come. Um, but it's, I think it's part and parcel with you know, public life that you you put yourself into with this role. Does, do you find that more and more people are willing to engage with municipal politicians in today's age? Because you're right, social media is one of these weird, and I'm a big proponent of not using social media to engage with politicians. I just don't think it's useful. I don't think it's a useful tool. If you want something done, email them, contact them, phone them. Most people's phone numbers are pretty public on, on uh, town websites. In the village of New Maryland, are you finding more and more people willing to have those face-to-face -face conversations and say, Alex, can I take five minutes of your time and have a discussion of why you voted for something? Or I've heard something, I just need it clarified. Or are you seeing more and more people going to those social media pages and sort of becoming sort of disconnected with what the politicians are doing at city hall. Yeah, look, some, some folks will still reach out and, and I think those are always fruitful conversations because you learn, uh, you know, what, what's important. Um, but, um, yeah, those folks that, that don't, um, engage directly and instead speculate on what your decisions are, um, that's that really is frustrating, um, simply because um, I think there's a lack of understanding of all of the facts that go into a decision, all of the things that we as a council look at, um, and you know we we are um, I know from our council we are very very open to 
any uh, discussions that that constituents want to have. Our meetings are open. Um, we're uh, easily contacted. Our contact names and numbers are available on our websites. So it's it's not as if we are hiding from any issues. Um, I, I have seen in some other communities will they'll take phone numbers off and and uh, you know you can contact by email. But I I encourage people to call me. I've got my personal cell phone number always available. If somebody wants to call me, they can get me twenty four seven. And and I've said that before and come to regret it at times. But uh, you know it, it's uh, it is. Um, it's, it is frustrating as somebody that wants to represent the folks in our community where they don't want to engage in those discussions directly. Um, but it's not for everyone either. I think some people are intimidated um, and, and just don't want to um, either don't have the confidence or don't have the, uh, uh, the desire to be confrontational directly. They'll do it uh, informally behind the scenes, so passive aggressive, um, which is frustrating because I just don't think that leads to good decision decisions. Um, I encourage the the, uh, the feedback because I think that makes for better decisions anyway. Prior to launching the show, I, I, I found that there was an apathy going on with municipal uh, governance and municipal politics in general. And when I launch the show, I'll be the first to admit that I didn't think most people would want to listen to uh, someone talk to a municipal politician. But I found uh, a unique space and people seem to be enjoying uh, the municipal perspective. In the village, do you find that there is an apathy of what's going on municipally? Or is there a sense that as long as the garbage is picked up, as long as the water is turned on, I am okay as long as my property taxes are at a semi-decent level and you're not gouging me every year. I'm comfortable with what's going on in the village and I really don't need to pay attention. Or do you find people actually wanting to engage? Yeah, that's that's an interesting point too because <laughs> we see in the last two uh, municipal elections, the voter turnout has been terrible. Um, granted, in, in And not just in New Brunswick. Oh, I should put that out yeah, there. Not yeah, just in New Brunswick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and that uh, that level of apathy, um, you, you could look at it one of two ways. You could say, well, things are so run so well that people think, ah, oh, there's no need to say anything, no need to run. Uh, or um, more um, concerning wise is if they feel that they're so frustrated because nobody's listening to them, uh, then what's the point of even voting? Or the people that I'm voting for don't represent what my concerns are. And that that really um, concerns me in particular because then obviously I haven't done enough to make sure I'm engaging with the folks in our community and understand what they're concerned about. And if they don't feel it's it's necessary to vote um, because they're so frustrated that their their voice isn't being heard, uh, then the whole system is not working as it should. So what do you do? What do you do in that case? Because as a former communication staffer for a municipality, I, 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 I came to realize that you can communicate every single venue. You can do radio, print, Facebook. You can do everything. You could do mail outs. You can put it in your utility bills. But there's always going to be the people who say, I didn't get it. I didn't know this was happening. How am I supposed to know? What do you yeah. do? And I'm pointing to you right now, not the village, because we're going to talk about the village in a few seconds here. But what do you do to ensure that you do get a cross section and you hear from people and you hear from people in your community who are not traditionally on social media? Because uh, I can imagine the loudest voices are always the ones who seem to be the keyboard warriors. Yeah, uh, it, it's that's that's the question. What? How do you get out to people that just don't want to listen? Or don't it's not so much they don't want to listen, but they they just won't pay attention to it. Um, we we constantly have this discussion amongst council, and I know you said don't take this question personally in terms of what what I do. Um, if you I want to talk about what the village does, you can as well. It's no, a good segue into our next segment. So go ahead. <laughs> no, I, I would say two things. First of all, um, I I have to make sure that I get every household. When, I, when I've gone out in campaigns, and, and the 2020 election, we didn't because of COVID. Um, and and we, we had, uh, you talk about voter apathy, we, uh, all of our council was acclaimed. Uh, the, the one position that was up for vote was, was our mayor. 
um, but all the council positions were were by acclamation, um, which is unfortunate, um, which meant that we didn't necessarily have to go out and campaign. Um, I believe it's important to do that, uh, to get out door to door. Um, not only did I run municipally in 2016, I also ran in 2018 uh, provincially, uh, and we have a massive riding. It's like 80 kilometers long and wide, and I spent six months making sure I got to every household, every single household in that in that uh, riding. And I was told by my provincial party that don't bother, you're not going to get the votes from these people over here. And yeah, it may be over there, but don't bother going over here. I, I could not in, in good conscience do that. I had to make sure that I spoke to every person. And uh, the same goes at the municipal level too. From my perspective is uh, I have to get out and talk to people. If, if they're not listening or not getting engaged and we're continually having this silence on everything from our budget to uh, you know decisions on housing or um, our new park uh, that we wanna build, um, if, if there is a lack of engagement, you're not going to have the best decisions made. So I think it's a responsibility for us as a council to get out and speak to people um, where they live. Uh, meet them at the uh, the local gymnasium, at the school, at the supermarket, you know, and engage them as, as best as possible. Um, you won't reach everyone, but as many as possible. I think that's that's absolutely important. Just a side note. I heard something worse when I ran federally in 2015. I heard you're not even going to win. So don't even worry about campaigning. <laughs> At least they told you to campaign. My party said, right. don't even campaign. So there you go. The sacrificial goat. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I want to yeah. turn to uh, segment two because I'm cautious of time. And prior to uh, starting this line of questioning, I'm going to preface it as I always do, that this is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not even a policy of council. This is the councillor's opinion and his opinion alone. So with that being said, councillor, in your opinion, what do you believe is the biggest issue or issues facing the village of New Maryland today as of recording this episode? Uh, I, I would say, I would answer that in, in two different ways. Um, first of all, um, in the way that I think um, our residents uh, will see those issues, but also has the, the, the big issues that our council views. So in terms of what residents may see, um, I, I think the impact of climate change and how that's had a significant impact on our community, we're in a constant hunt now for water. Uh, we just, um, we're in the process of finishing off a new well uh, or well field, um, running new lines, things like that. Had that not come about, we would have had uh, great challenges with continued growth in the community. We would have had great challenges with safety, um, living in a, a rural community with forests all around us. If we don't have water, should anything God forbid happen, uh, that would be a critical situation. Um, but uh, that I think was was a key issue that our community faced. We have a new well field, but even with that well field coming on and the development that's going to bring, that's not going to last forever. So climate change has had an impact on that as well. We've got to be constantly looking for, uh, for water uh, for our community. The second part, though, is, is something that I don't think our residents are um, as aware of, and that is through municipal reform, the impacts this is going to have on the services we provide and how we provide those services, but also the costs uh, that's going to, uh, to come their way. Um, they'll see it on their tax bills. They might not see it today, but I mentioned earlier the download of services that the province has put on us. Um, they've done the municipal reform part. They haven't done the municipal fiscal reform yet. And um, coming from my perspective, working with the, uh, the association that represents municipalities across the province, we are extremely concerned about that because um, at the end of the day, if we don't have the resources to be able to provide those services, one of two things can happen. The services either are diminished or taken away or taxes have to go up to pay for them. Um, either way is not a very good solution. 
Um, you know, the, the province, uh, we have to continue pushing the province to do that. So it's making sure that our residents understand exactly why decisions are being made, what impact the municipal reform process is going to have on them. Um, at the end of the day, this should have been a very good thing for municipalities as a whole. But without the fiscal reform to follow the municipal reforms, uh, it just it's a job that's half complete. And as being half complete, it's not it's half effective or <laughs> even worse. So. So I'm going to ask the million dollar political question here for a second. And I apologize to, because I try not to do the political stuff on the show because I try to make it more conversational. But you just said something that needs to be asked. Um, municipal reforms. And then you said fiscal reforms. Yes. Give me a silver lining that the Higgs government is doing something that the municipalities are anticipating this year, because you guys are heading to a provincial wide election sometime this year. Are you optimistic? Yeah. And I, I, I ask that not just as a counselor, but also as past president of the UNB uh, Union, Union of New Brunswick Municipalities, <laughs> I apologize, <laughs> uh, UNBM. Um, Give me some silver lining that the municipalities can sort of navigate this financial, not storm, but yeah. hiccup. Well, I, I think part of the silver lining right now is uh, property tax assessments went up significantly. If you, if you can look at that as a silver lining, yeah. um, what it what it's meant is that municipalities didn't have to increase their tax rates. But what it's also meant is a pocketbook issue for residents because they were hit pretty hard on tax bills, which weren't the fault of municipalities. Um, but they'll I, blame I, again, you. Though. I don't like to. But they'll blame yeah, you exactly. because because they see it as a municipal tax, though they're seeing that yeah. tax go up. Yeah. And, and it didn't help with one of uh, the provincial ministers saying that. Um, yeah, the the uh, the property tax uh, assessments. Uh, you know, we we don't see any money from that. That all goes to the municipalities. So if you have an issue with this, you should go talk to your municipal government. So that was frustrating. Uh, I'm frustrated just lining, hearing that. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah. We uh, we would read those comments and and not care for them very much. But the um, I think the silver lining is we have. Um, a lot of uh, folks that that understand the issues uh, that see what's happened, um, we we have a a concern that um, our premier has looked at what uh, municipalities are doing and has a perception that uh, we are overfunded and spend too freely, and therefore don't require all of the uh, fiscal reforms that we've been asking for. Um, that perception, unfortunately, is is so far from the truth. Uh, the provincial government uh, had um, uh, a report completed by two independent consultants that came out just before Christmas, just when the, the ledge closes. Last day, here you go, it's released. And uh, the report states that uh, up to 29 of the, of the uh, new municipalities um, within the next three years are going to face critical funding decisions that they probably won't be able to balance their budgets. And we were hopeful that that would be the, the eye-opening um, just jar uh, for our government that says, yeah, we've got to do something about this. Um, we do have regular meetings with the province, with uh, the Minister of Environment and Local Government, um, with the Premier's office and, and with uh, cab or caucus last week, in, in fact, um, we spoke uh, to cabinet about it. So there's a lot of things that uh, I think we can push. Um, I'm not necessarily hopeful that the, those are going to change the perceptions. Um, but I expect that if it if things keep going the way they're going and some municipalities run into great financial difficulties, the residents will carry on the fight with us as opposed to blaming municipalities too. And, and that's that's really um, unfortunate because municipal reform in itself should have solved a lot of the issues. Um, and I go back to what the province has said all along in this process. They wanted vibrant and sustainable communities. Well, in order to do to have both of those things, 
You've got to be able to give us the tools to be able to do the things that you want us to do. They've downloaded services. They've asked us to do more with less. And, uh, you know, it, it, that's frustrating. I would also say, though, and this is the silver lining that I'll, I'll get to. It's a long way around. But uh, you, um, we have found that the premier has been um, very interested in anything that can help the province. Uh, so he's recognized that for economic development purposes, for example, or tourism, um, municipalities can have a very impactful, uh, uh, I guess, role in, in, that, uh, in those areas. So if you want us to be impactful in those areas, you have to make sure that we are vibrant and sustainable. And uh, again, if you want the province to do better, our feeling is the municipalities have to do well. We can, can uh, be very effective in these areas. We can be very effective in making sure residents get the services that they need. But in order to do that, you have to make sure we have the resources to do that. So to, to coin a phrase from Jerry Maguire, it's uh, help us help you. Uh, and and I think uh, I think that message is is getting across uh, uh, more and more these days too. What role does the federal government have to play in this situation as well? Because as the as, as the past president of the UN UN and U N B M, you sat on the board of FCM as well. So you sat in yeah. Ottawa. You met with ministers. You have probably met with the prime minister in your time as well. Does the role of the federal government, while they don't acknowledge or even identify municipalities in the Constitution, they do work closely with municipalities. Do you see a role that the federal government needs to play as well to ensure villages like the village of New Maryland or communities in New Brunswick are viable, not just today, but 10 years, 20 years, 15 years from now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's it's challenged because of, you know, we, we talked earlier about jurisdictions and, uh, you know, what each level of government is supposed to be doing and the blurring of those responsibilities as each government gets into different areas. Um, we saw a few months ago where the federal government wanted to provide funding directly to municipalities for housing so they could avoid the red tape and avoid delays. Um, and, and that was not received well by our provincial government, even though they recognized there was an acute need for housing. Um, and it became very much an issue of, of uh, you know, we don't want you giving any money to our municipalities unless we have an opportunity to tell you where the money goes. Um, so yes, I, I think that if we want, there's recognition from the federal government that if they want things to happen as quickly as possible, why not go to the government level that's closest to the people? Um, but that it becomes politicized, um, you know, which parties are being supported here, there, are everywhere. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a. <laughs> no, I appreciate your answer because I just want to make sure that we, I, I let my listeners know that I do not just blame the provincial governments on this matter. The federal government does have a role to play as well. It is a all hands on deck situation, not just let's yeah. gang up on one level of government. I want to talk about climate change for a second, if you don't mind. And I know I'm cautious of time. So hopefully you have an extra five minutes to spare and we can get through climate change in five minutes. I know that's a lot, a lot riding on your answers here, but we're going to try. Um, okay. You are you have openly just said that you are on the hunt for water, and we are seeing an increasingly dry winter this year, and especially out here in Western Canada. I'm not sure about Eastern Canada, but I, I have some friends in New Brunswick and actually in your area of neck of the woods. And what I hear is it's been somewhat dry as well. There hasn't been as much snow as in past years. Um that means wildfire season is coming up. And that means we just saw a horrible wildfire season last year and the year before. Uh, give me some hope that uh, water is not going to be a precious thing and you're going to have to sort of ask people to scale back on water in 2024 as we approach a warmer weather. Well, it's funny you should ask that question today because <laughs> they had snow again last week in, uh, in Nova Scotia and PEI and, and uh, parts of Newfoundland too. Um, we didn't, uh, fortunately, um, most of New Brunswick didn't see that that level of uh, snowfall. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's absolutely a concern too. We see that 
Um, like our, our um, uh, public works department talks to us on a regular basis about uh, concerns about uh, water supply uh, and infrastructure that we have. And what we heard was that half of our community is on wells, half of our community is, is uh, on the municipal system. And the half that uh, are on the municipal system uh, during some, some really dry periods uh, over the last couple of years, our well level went down significantly, our municipal well field, and uh, didn't replenish as quickly as, uh, as we would like or make us feel comfortable. Um, so in that, in that way, and, and you talk about the potential for wildfires and things like that, you know, we're, we're, um, we're talking about a pretty uh, uh, concerning issue uh, for us. And that's why we're always on that hunt for water. Um, we we're fortunate though, where we found the new well field was a particularly um, wet area within the, uh, the municipality. So from our community, uh, we've got now a, a good source of um, good quality um, water uh, that doesn't have to be treated too much. Um, but with climate change, it's something that uh, we have to continue to be cognizant of. We've we've warned residents, as you said. Um, you know, I know you want the silver, the silver lining here, or the the good news. Um, unfortunately, I think we always have to be um, looking at it critically, and and uh, there isn't always good news. Um, in our case, we've asked residents to uh, to do the things that would um, you know, preserve our water supply. If that means, um, you know, watering your your uh, lawn uh, late at night, uh, early in the morning, or not doing it at all, in particularly critical times of the day, um, we've asked them to do that. Uh, you know, it, it's been it's been a challenge, um, and I don't think it, there is a silver lining here too. Um, we've we've tried uh, as best we can to be. Um, Part of the solution by looking at different means of, um, you know, heating, uh, different means of electrical uh, hookups with with uh, solar arrays and um, solar lighting and things like that. Um, but uh, it's we're at a critical juncture in in uh, in terms of climate change, and we've got to all be part of that solution. Now, you've talked about two very big macro issues that are facing your community, municipal reform and climate change. But if I go talk to 100 people in your village tomorrow and I ask them that exact same question, what's the biggest issue? They're going to give me yeah. some very micro issues. That pothole yeah. in front of my house, that sidewalk, that playground, yeah. you have probably heard them all. Now, you at the end of the day know that municipalities only have a limited supply of money and you can't run deficits. So therefore, you're going to have to say no to some people. And that's going to upset them. How do you yeah. ensure that everyone's voices feel heard in times of budgets and times of addressing their uh, issues? Because when they approach you with that micro issue, that issue that they believe is the most important issue to them, you have to say sometimes, unfortunately, we can't do that this year. How do you balance the needs of the community with the needs of the one? And yes, for those who are listening, I'm quoting Spock there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's uh, that's a really, really good question. It's uh, I think it's part of the, the, the life you balance as a municipal council member. Uh, we we have to look at what's best for the community as a whole. I, I go back to what I stated earlier that uh, um I can't look at what's best for each individual person. Um, if there's an issue that uh, that they have, yeah, we'll certainly look at it and we'll certainly look at, at uh, whether or not that can be handled um, as appropriate, but you you can't please everybody all the time. There, there, uh, there has to be um, a certain amount of give. And I, I, I go back to um, a course I took in university on philosophy and uh, I think it was John Locke and the Leviathan that everybody gives up a little bit of their power uh, to the community as a whole so that the community then can do what's best. Um, and that, I know that's getting out there a little bit too, but- uh, I, I'm just saying, I quote Spock on this show and you quote the <laughs> Leviathan. I feel really Leviathan. bad right now. <laughs> I have probably quoted it wrong, but I, I remember some things from my university career. Uh, <laughs> 
uh, yeah, obscure facts, uh, but uh, it's it's just I think part of of what it means to be part of a community that you can't get everything you want all the time. To be part of a community, you have to do what's best for your community, and that means sometimes you uh, everybody has to take a little water in their wine. I appreciate that. I, I want to turn to my last segment and because it's my favorite subject and I've made a promise that if you come on the show, I come to your community. So this summer I'm going to be in New Brunswick because there is about 15 communities that I've promised this to, and I was supposed to do it last year, but I wasn't able to, but this year it oh, is awesome. a, it is a plan. What are some of the tourist spots in the village of New Maryland that you would suggest you would recommend to tourists and to potentially someone coming to your community this year? Well, our, our community is is small. Um, we're just on the outside of, of Fredericton, and I don't want to be known as a bedroom community of Fredericton. Um, so I, I point to a couple of things. Uh, we have a lovely uh, park uh, or a trail system around our recreation center that uh, has, um, it's a walking trail. It has uh, bridges, suspension bridges. It has uh some lovely scenery. Um, I, I recommend that. Um, we have some good uh, bike trails uh, through the area, um, both on the highway and, and uh, uh, through the community. There's walking trails that kind of link all of it together. Um, we're very much, um, well, I, I think our, our sort of tagline has always been uh, rural charm and urban convenience. Um, I don't love that because I think at the end of the day that basically says that we're a bedroom community of a bigger community. Um, but uh, we uh, we have a wonderful school here. Um, we have what I in particular would, would say about New Maryland, it's not necessarily a site or something to come here and see, but it's the wonderful community and sense of caring that we have. Um, and, and the best example I can give of that is uh, we have a, a Lions Club here in New Maryland, and every year we do a food and toy drive. And this year, the food and toy drive extended out over four days. Um, it was a parade through every community within the, the community, so every subdivision, um, with uh, a float. Our fire department got involved. There was two vehicles from the fire department. We had a float with Santa Claus on it. And we went door to door and collected food and toys for uh, needy families at Christmas. And we supported a hundred and well, actually this year, I think it was 215 uh, uh, different families. Um, we had more than enough toys to not only support them, but also to support three or four other organizations. So it's, it's a community that really um, cares about uh, others. And uh, if anything, I think what, if someone asked me what I was most proud of about this community, I'd have to say it would be that uh, we have a very caring uh, community. So. so you basically took my last question out of my mouth here, there, counselor, and that was going to be uh -oh. <laughs> what makes uh, New Maryland such a unique place to live, to work and to raise a family? Yeah, I, I I would say that would be it. It, it is a, a caring community. Um, we have neighbors that look out for neighbors. Um, if uh, if you walk down the street, people wave, people say hello. Um, the uh, what they um, the reason that that people come here is because of that friendliness. It's because of um, what. Um, what they feel um, attaches them to the community, and uh, and in that way too, it's 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 a pleasure for me to represent a community like that too. So, Alex, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for sitting down and taking time out of your busy schedule to talk about yourself. Talk about my favorite thing is municipal politics and the village of New Maryland. I I look forward to visiting your community later this year, and hopefully we can grab a coffee while I'm there and we can sit down and continue this conversation. So thank you so much for doing this. I love that. It's my pleasure. Thank you for for uh, having me on. Thank you so much for joining us. And if this episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button or follow button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth conversations on the cross-border interviews and even our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work.
Now, we are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage, committed to keeping you well-informed and engaged. Your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to enjoy. Now, if you can, please consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.